Hey everyone, welcome to Ear Fuel episode number four. As always, I'm Joel Freemark. So glad to be deep in your ears this week. Yep, got a lot of fun and knowledge in store for you. It's going to be a good time. If you're one of those Twitter types, hey, go ahead and follow me over at Get Ear Fuel and at The Daily Guru. What you heard at the top there was a brief moment from my chat with Patrick Dennis. We will get to that in a bit. First up, though, this week brought us a release so sudden yet important that I think it deserves to be the only album that I talk about this week. And it is, of course, the brand new record from Dr. Dre, and it's called Compton, a soundtrack. You can just call it Compton because that's what most people are going to refer to it as. Anyway, it's been 16 years since Dr. Dre last formally put out a record. And just a few months ago, that long-awaited, long-rumored record, Detox, was basically killed off. We've been talking about Detox since, I think, probably 2002 or something like that. And uh, it is no more, so a lot of people were pretty bummed out. Now, this record... It didn't exactly come out of nowhere, but I don't think there were many people who thought he was this far along in putting together an entire album. The reality is, it was a bit spur of the moment, as Dre himself said that he was inspired to get back into the studio whilst working on the new NWA biopic, Straight Outta Compton. Now, Dre also referred to this record as, quote, his grand finale, so uh, it's safe to assume that this is going to be his last recording, as an MC at least, in any formal way. I'm sure he'll show up here and there, and he's definitely going to keep producing, but I think when it comes to hearing him rhyme on a track, this is it. At first glance, though, for me, this record appeared to be more akin to his Aftermath compilation that came back in 1996. Most people don't know it exists. It's actually pretty cool. There's some great tracks on there. Uh, and the, the comparison I saw is because every single one of the tracks on Compton has a huge long list of feature artists. Now, the difference is Dre himself does drop a verse on almost every song, so I guess it's a mixture of that and his other work. Anyway, though, on to the album itself. It will come as a surprise to absolutely nobody that the music and beats here are, for the most part, absolutely mind-blowing. No question, Dre has not lost a step in his ability to create diverse, unique soundscapes to rhyme over, and while he doesn't hit it out of the park on every song, there are enough home runs here to make any hip-hop head happy. Songs like Genocide and Just Another Day are beyond solid, but damn, One Shot Kill. The song One Shot to Kill. Absolutely flawless. So good. I love that track. But we're talking more than just beats and music here. Dre reminds us with this record what it means to build an atmosphere on a hip-hop track. Songs like Talk About It, It's All On Me, and Satisfaction really speak to that because they really encapsulate you and there's a definite mood going on here. That being said, though, I had some issues with this record, both big and small. First off, on many of these tracks, Dre is modulating and even auto-tuning his voice to a point that it doesn't even sound like him. The most glaring example of that is on the song Satisfaction, and on Genocide, he sounds less like Dre and more like Andre 3000 from Outkast. And yet, there are a number of songs here that have the unfiltered Dre vocal, and they sound great. So we know he can still do that, and I really have no idea why he chose to mess with it. Also, there's a lot of stealing on this record from verses to entire pieces. Now, not not musically, but there there is definitely some uh, lyrical theft going on. The second verse on Just Another Day rips word for word a line from the Method Man, Red Man track to Rockweiler from their Blackout record. And the entire closing of Loose Cannons is so stolen from Eminem, it's almost cringeworthy. There's there's paying tribute or doing a send up. And then there's this. It's 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 embarrassing. But you also have the biggest problem on this album, and that is Anderson Pock. He ruins so many great songs here like Issues, Deep Water, Animals, and I'm not sure why Dre felt compelled to feature him so much on this record. I just don't get it. He sticks out like a sore thumb and just doesn't have the talent to hang with everybody else on this album. But there's a ton more great than bad on this album, and if for no other reason than to hear Eminem's verse on the song Medicine Man, you must, must, must get this record. The guy has one verse on the entire album, and he basically steals the show. Now, a lot of people are going to hate on it because it's another great moment from Eminem, and people love to hate on Eminem and say anyone who's into him doesn't know real hip-hop, but the reality is the verse is pure fire, and you have to hear it. It's also nice on this album that we hear Snoop Dogg performing as Snoop Dogg, and he sounds great, and Kendrick Lamar certainly holds his own. I did find it amusing, though, that on the final track, Dre drops the line, quote, I used to be a starving artist, so I would never starve an artist. 
Uh, apparently, Dre didn't read the iTunes terms of service. All in all, though, this record is absolutely worth checking out if you're a hip hop fan at any level. The music is truly fantastic. And if you can suffer through a few bad verses, there's a lot to love here. I really enjoyed this record. As Dre's swan song, I think it's more than respectable. And the trumpet at the end of the last song is a perfect closing to a trio of game changing releases that he has his name on. Moving on, this week I had the pleasure of sitting down with the amazing Patrick Dennis. We talked about his new record, the path that led him there, his views on music in general, kind of the genesis of music as it is. It was a really, really great conversation. We actually ended up doing this interview on a rooftop in Brooklyn about 16 floors up with this unobstructed view of the Manhattan skyline as the sun was setting. It was really, really cool. So if you hear some airplanes and other things, well, you know, that's that's why. You know Patrick Dennis from bands like the Truckee Brothers and Wire Pony, the latter of whom provided the intro music for my long-running YouTube series. And uh, his first album under his own name called First in the Dirt, that's F-U-R-S-T in the Dirt, came out a few weeks ago. And honestly, if you're into great rock and roll with killer melodies and a punk attitude, it really needs to be next on your list. So sit back and relax, uh, because as you'll hear in the interview, we are about as uh, chilled out as you're possibly going to get. Yeah, it's it's not a bad view up here. Oh God, what a night though! It's like that's gorgeous. Yeah, the darker it gets, the more stars we're gonna see. Well, unfortunately, you won't be seeing too many because it's still New York, so there's still that really bad uh, <laughs> ambience, yeah. ambient light. Yeah, um, it's not so bad out here though. I mean, it's not as much ambient light out in Brooklyn. No, no, no not like you're standing in Times Square or something. No, it's good. It's good. So, how's the new record going? The new record's great. Yeah. I'm really, uh, I'm obviously really proud of the record and. And um, the shows, you never know if the songs really work, even though you cut them live in the studio, essentially. You never know if they work until they're in front of an audience. Sure. So the few shows we've done so far have been a wonderful uh, revelation. The first night was definitely halfway through realizing uh, this stuff works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> wow, people, people like, like it. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And I like it even more importantly. Yeah, and, and playing with the guys I'm playing with now, which happened completely accidentally, I ended up with a with an all San Diego band. Nice, uh, which is where I'm from, and uh, but I made the record in Nashville, and uh, and I was trying to put a band together because I live in Los Angeles, so it was convenient for me, so I wouldn't have to drive a million miles to rehearse mm -hmm. of people in Los Angeles, and it just didn't work. It didn't didn't work out, and. Three days before a, a gig with John Doe, mm -hmm. I called Andrew McCaig, who's in the Presidents of the United States, mm -hmm. and was in a great San Diego band, San, San Diego Seattle band called Uncle Joe's Big Old Driver. Sure. And uh, just said, uh, so you want to do this thing, and who should we get? And, and went through the entire laundry list of people and accidentally happened uh, to have Paul Bruin Mm -hmm. from Uncle Joe's Big Old Driver say that he'd play drums and a friend of mine Bill Driscoll who's an amazing musician he's got a band called The Anomaly which is one of my favorite new bands I dig that name I like that and uh, it's an amazing band they're sort of uh, desert rock uh, stoner rock Queens of the Stone Age kind of vibe I, I, and he sounds plays, good to me he plays everything on it I mean if he was if he was fast enough if he, he was the human flash he would be able to we wouldn't have to show up for the gig he could play everything but uh, so he was going to play drums originally, mm -hmm. and at the last minute, the bass player buddy of mine had to drop out, and um, Paul said he would play drums. So I I called Bill and said, "Could you learn the parts today for the bass?" <laughs> and I got there, and he'd learned all the parts for the bass, wow. and we rehearsed. And Paul walked in, and we rehearsed. It was amazing. And Paul walked. Paul afterwards, we were sitting having a having a drink, and he says, um, "Do you remember walking up to me eight years ago?" Uh, at the Casbah and saying I'm going to be in a band with you one day <laughs> and I suddenly remembered the whole thing yeah. and realized I got the guy in the band I wanted and I wasn't even the guy who called him Andrew called him nice it so just it just took a, it just took a different route to it get it just there. took a different route and then we we played these shows and it feels like a band it doesn't feel like this is my solo record and I've hired some dudes sure we're we, we're calling we we call ourselves Patrick Dennis and the Never the Sames you know, as a joke, because uh -huh. it's never the same. And we, sure. we're, every night, we're so far, we've been trying completely different ways to do it, from changing the set to 
just leaving it wide open, leave the script mm -hmm. and see what the band can do. And it's proven to be great. As as someone who has played their fair share of drums, you know, both recreationally and on record, <laughs> is it is it weird for you to have somebody else drumming behind you? Do you, you know, does your brain sometimes kind of go away and, you know, hear something different? No, I tend to listen to the drummer probably more than anybody else, uh -huh. which uh, in in this case though everybody is at such a such a monster level that I'm I'm constantly being dragged over to the hearing the bass and what Bill's doing and then back to the drums and but no I I hear the drummer I love it when I'm hearing the drummer put these extra pushes in and I'll turn with Paul he's he's got this beatific smile on his face all the time and uh, and I'll turn around because he'll he'll throw some fill in there and it'll just make me laugh and uh -huh. I'll, I'll just I'll end up turning around and <laughs> acknowledging what he just did. Uh, but drummers are so important. Uh, the irony is that I didn't get to play drums on my record at all. There, no, everybody else who was on the record played drums. Literally everybody. Is this is this the first one of your records that you played on where you didn't have anything, on, no drumming at all? Yeah, actually, I think it probably is. I think even Truckee Records I yeah. played drums on. At least somewhere. Uh, somewhere. Uh, Wire Pony Records I played drums on somewhere. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, it's everybody. Adam and Justin played drums. I played a, I played a floor time on one song for one bar. That one whole it. bar. So one you, whole have, bar. you have like... So you have I, like... I do have a drum credit, actually, okay. on it. But Rob Crowell, who plays keys in Deer Tick, he played the most insane punk rock drums on the record. Uh -huh. you know? And... Uh, and Matt Lenat from the Truckee Brothers played drums, and then he played piano as well on a song. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, it was just it was great. But I didn't get to play drums. I was really bummed about that. So with with, with the record with First in the Dirt, um, how did that come to be? Because you know you you had the Truckee Brother years, then you did Wire Pony, and then there was kind of uh, you know with Joe Strummer they referred to them as the Wilderness years. Um, yeah, that what, would figure. What, yeah, right. Yeah. What 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 inspired this record? How did it come about? Everything about this record down to these last couple months with the band forming has been just strangely synchronistic. There's nothing that I've controlled about it whatsoever. S so uh, the truckies sort of ended. We stepped out of a van and it was over. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know that I'd ever make another record again. Sure. So, um, that last truckie tour, I met this guy, uh, who's a painter, a well-known painter, who lives in Las Cruces, New Mexico. His name is Carlos Estrada Vega. Okay. And uh, he's, he's sort of the, uh, he has this theory about, about light and spirit and the way it, it works. Really amazing theories. Fascinating guy. Used to be a Jesuit priest. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he sort of uh, instigated the whole start of this by challenging me as to why I was doing what I was doing. And, and, and that I had a anybody who has a uh, talent for something has a responsibility to use the talent to follow through with it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, and that it's a gift, and even the desire to do it is a gift, which I'd never really considered before. So he got me thinking, and I I went home with my head spinning, and and then the the band ended, and it was a really painful sort of year. Um, Alternately, it's. I also fell in love that year with with my now wife, mm -hmm. who's uh, Cindy Wasserman from Dead Rock West, mm -hmm. another great band. Yes, uh, and uh, I spent the year kind of really pondering whether I was going to make any more music. I felt like I, I was contributing to a problem more than a solution mm -hmm. in the way I was doing things. And so ultimately, a friend invited me to Nashville for Thanksgiving, and I I went. I had an amazing week. Um, I daily was meeting people like Kenny Vaughn, uh, amazing guitar player and a bit of a local legend there. Mm -hmm. uh, T.G. Shepard, who was a, was a, a country star in the 70s and 80s and, and grew up literally in Graceland with Elvis. Nice. Um, and uh, and I, all these people. And then I, I stepped on some dude's shoes coming out of the bathroom in the basement <laughs> in Nashville. and. and then I see him get on stage and, and put on the most amazing rock show. And uh, as Justin and the Cosmics. Okay. And Justin Collins. And I I still didn't know what else Justin did. So we'd meet up and we'd have beers occasionally. And finally one day I asked him, you know, what else do you do? And all of these people this entire week were saying, you need to come to Nashville. 
and uh, I was so fired up by it. I I came back to I came home. It was Christmas time. Cindy had been on the road. She comes home. I said, "Hey, uh, I got this idea. I'm going to move to Nashville for a few months." You know? <laughs> and understandably, for about 24 hours, she's like, "What the hell are you seriously? I just got home, and you're going to leave and go to move to Nashville? What the hell is that?" And and then she woke up the next morning and said, "Actually, I think it's a really great idea. You sure. know, go give it a shot." So drove out there and and I'm just working on video and film projects and nothing to do with music. And uh, I end up having beers with Justin one night. Well, you know what? What else do you do? Well, I produce records. Well, what records? Oh, Deer Tick, Diamond Rugs. You know, starts rattling yeah, it off. No big deal. Ah, you're kidding me. I love those <laughs> records. We've <laughs> no, got to do fantastic. something. So we we just kind of started the whole thing off really organically it was let's let's record a few songs and Cindy and I were in New York we were driving back we drove back to Nashville and uh, we'd booked a session for the next day and I I wrote this song hit of you on the way there and we recorded it the next day and as soon as I heard the playback I thought I, I, I've got to record more songs I still didn't think we'd make a record but you know I've got to record more songs with these guys because mm -hmm. it was such an organic great feeling and the limitation of recording to tape. And, sure. And, you know, you you got to make choices. And all these things were just really, really uh, revitalizing, you know. Mm -hmm. Did did the rest of the songs in the process, did they did they come quickly or, no. you know? No? Well, the, the songs came quickly. The process didn't. Uh -huh. um, we, we did that. We cut, and I cut another song with a friend of mine, Ann McHugh, which will come out next year. Nice. Um, uh, and then we sort of took a break, and I... I I decided I wanted to bring Matt out, Matt Lenat, mm -hmm. and uh, and we uh, booked a few days and and we recorded those songs and we had about you know an EP's worth, about ha half of what ended up on the record. Sure. Um, and still not thinking I was going to make a record though, not not knowing what was going to happen. And um, then I went back to L.A. for a little bit and I busted my hand. Yeah, um, I remember that. And uh, that, uh, yeah, Cindy's sitting here laughing about it. <laughs> I busted my hand. Now, she was she was helping me with some gear and, th yeah. and threw threw some bag in my direction that had all my pedals in it, and my <laughs> my hand was still out. All my fingers were still straight out, and and it hit me. And yeah. and then uh, she was talking to me. I said, I, I think I busted my finger. She said, Oh, nonsense. You know, I I think I I, I mean whining. it's moving it's moving sideways. You know it's yeah and uh and you know i had i'd shattered the the knuckles and the finger and Eesh. so so that was a lot of pins and and surgery and physical therapy and so mm -hmm. there, there were six months where nothing was happening you know i couldn't do anything i couldn't wipe my own ass <laughs> i couldn't open a can of beans <laughs> she she left the next day on tour as well she, oh, she was gone injures so you and abandons you i was trying to convince my sons to drive up and open cans of food for me and put them <laughs> in plastic tupperware so that i could actually eat <laughs> nice but so it, it it took a while yeah you know and then and then finally uh went back a friend of mine just I was I was asking his advice on what I should do, and he said, "Just go finish the damn thing." Sure. So we did. We booked a we booked a few more days and got Rob Crowell and everybody together and and cut the rest of the record. What turned out to be a record, and I think at that point, I realized we we had a record and we mm -hmm. had to figure out how to put it out. So. And and before you started recording, had you made the decision to put it out under your own name, or did that come somewhere in the process? Somewhere in the process. I, was, I wasn't I was sure at first whether it would, uh, where, whether I would keep the Wire Pony name, because mm -hmm. it was, it was a, at least somewhat of an investment in a, in, in a lot of touring sure. and, and the previous records, but it doesn't have anything to do with that band. It doesn't, it doesn't musically have anything to do with that band. It doesn't, uh, emotionally, it's a totally different space in my uh -huh. life, even. So I felt like it was time to own my own name, sure, for the first time ever. I mean, I, I uh, as you as you know, I, I, every band I would be in, I would literally change my name. So if you look on the All Music Guide, yeah. you can't. You, the only credit I have is as a designer of a record cover. <laughs> There's my name is not on sure, any sure. any. Uh, listing for any records is this other dude Pete or this other guy or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever so it, it it I decided to own it okay um, and which I think made the made me more focused as to what I was writing about too because it's more it's more personal it's more personal yeah yeah and and the title first in the dirt with an awesome umlaut well the title is really kind of odd 
creepy too about wh- after the fact um i had been i'd been wanting to play with the the idea of i was debating calling it first okay um with or without umlaut without umlaut okay. just just first it was the first record and yeah. i just thought well it's just just be obvious about this sure and then uh i wanted to have a little play on words and and um i re- remembered that uh uh the german word for prince sounds like you know first it sounds mm-hmm. like first uh, and people would in America would mispronounce pronounce it as first, and uh, so I thought first, first in the dirt. And I'd been, um, I had been during the mixing session. I kept hearing, you know, the, the Pretenders stole that great line. Uh, we're all of us in the gutter. Yep. Some of us are staring at the stars. Yep. Uh, and it's absolutely a truth and a fantastic line. But I had that. I had that spinning in my head the whole time. Sure, sure. Uh, while we were doing the mixes. And so I just had this idea of, you know, gone through a lot of stuff in those, a, a lot of personal crap in those years um, leading up to making the record and then making the record. And I, I had been insane. I mean, when the truckies broke up, I was personally pretty insane. And Cindy will tell you I was pretty out of control and, mm-hmm. and, and hard to handle and, and uh, thank goodness for the patience of a good woman. <laughs> but um, but uh, so it was this idea of, you know, y- you are you may be beaten down or you may have beaten yourself down or any number of things, but you still have this capacity for being uh, great, for being what you can be. Sure. Everybody has this. Um, so it was this idea of, of you might be down, you might be down on the ground, but you still... You still have the potential to be this, this, uh, this prince, princess, not in a, like a, above anybody way, but yeah. in the sense that you have the ability to claim what you really are. And um, so I, I, I scribbled this down with a couple other names, and and I was talking to Cindy and a couple other friends, a playwright friend of mine, and a couple of friends, and and everybody seemed to really connect with that title as as well as me. So I was, sort of gave them a bunch of ringers and. And um, so I thought, well, that's it. We'll name that that title, and it's a German word. And mm-hmm. and uh, and I uh, I always assumed that I'm uh, my mother's Callahan. My father is as English as you can get. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, Irish and and English, and there's some German in there, way way back. But I wasn't even really aware of that. Okay. Uh, there's French, there's all these things, but really my mom's an American. We can trace the family back to the, to the civil war. And, and I had heard rumors of prior to that. Uh So the thing is actually at the pressing house being printed. And, uh, my uncle sends a note and I, uh, that he's been doing all this ancestry.com stuff. turns out that my mother's side of the family has been here since 1645. They came directly from Germany. And he can trace the family in Germany for 300 years after that. Wow. And and then I didn't even twig. It did not even occur to me that my great grandfather, who is the first person I remember trying to teach me a song, sitting uh-huh. on his bed, teach me cowboy songs. Nice. His last name was Prince. Amazar Prince. Nice. And he was a southern boy from Georgia. Uh-huh. And I did not even think about this when I was naming the record. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, you know, some sort of strange sure. otherworldly. Yeah. Yeah. Very Oddity is the why I got named first in the dirt. Uh, first in the dirt. Yeah. You know, with with what you were saying, you know, you've you you can have say that German with an Irish accent, first in the dirt. First in the dirt. I can't do Irish. I can barely do German. Oh be Jesus big alley. I'll just I'll just do my Cleveland accent I've been told I have. Um, you know, you, you, you have so much, obviously, different ancestry there. And, you know, people from the South, California. A lot of all, us do. That, all these we? different things. How did that impact kind of uh, your musical upbringing then? Well, I'm, I'm kind of schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. my Like I say, my, grand, my great-grandfather would play all these cowboy songs. My mm-hmm. mom loved folk music. My English father uh, had all these blues records and rock and roll records. And, and then Sgt. Pepper and... And moody blues, mm-hmm. and then jazz like Ramsey Lewis Trio and things. But he would always insist on playing Willie Nelson's gospel record when we were kids <laughs> and we we're on trips. And I hated that record. Sure, I just couldn't stand it. I was pleased. Do we have to hear it again? And um, ironically enough, I mean, he's my favorite Fraser. I'm obsessed with him right now. Uh huh. And I've actually thanked my father for 
forcing that on us because it taught taught me an awful lot. You came back to it later in life and and, yeah. and saw the genius behind after it. all the punk rock and everything else, sure. Husker Du and all these all these things that I was listening to as a as a kid and then in my in my twenties and and um, my taste is all over the map. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you if you put on the my my iTunes purchases and let them go random, you you go everything from Julie Andrews, uh, uh, Mary Poppins to to the damned and, sure. and uh, over to ACDC and then to, uh, to Nina Simone. And you know, it's all over the map. It's all in the genre of good music. Yeah. That's it's all about it good is. songs and all, things that connect on the good stuff. Um, so on a very, uh, selfish level, a question I've wanted to ask, how did the truckies reunion come to pass? Well, if you ask Steve Poltz, he's got one version of the story, and that's that he did everything, and that Steve is solely responsible. He did actually. Okay. He did. He did. <laughs> he and Cindy. He and Cindy, my wife Cindy, actually kind of concocted this because they talked. Was he talked, wearing pants when it happened? Uh, he probably not. Yeah. Probably um, not. <clears throat> I don't know. She hasn't told me. Uh, but uh, uh, he, um, he and she were talking about. Uh, I, unbeknownst to me, a couple of weeks before the the whole thing started. How are we going to get these guys to talk again? And, uh-huh. and we should uh, we should do something. And, and um, you know they were both agreeing. And Steve just said, "I'm going to I'm going to do something." It happened to be our home club is the Casbah in San Diego. It happened Great to be the 25th club. anniversary of the Casbah. Yeah, coming up that year. So I ironically I can I can actually from here on the rooftop here in Brooklyn I can see where I was when Steve called me. It was up there right at the base of Central Park, right. And uh, ironically enough, Steve was on the other side of Central Park calling me. And he, s- he sent a text, a group text, that basically said, uh, December whatever it was, mm-hmm. uh, Truckee Brothers, Casbah, you guys all in, Tim Mays wants, wants to do this. And uh, I just looked at it and looked at Cindy, and uh, you never guess what I got. She's looking kind of sheepish, you know, and I've, I've got this text. And... Um, I just said, there's no way. There's no way anybody's going to say yes. Yeah. So I just ignored it. Five minutes later, two of the guys, the rhythm section, said, yeah, absolutely, hell yeah. And I just looked at that and thought, well, there's another person that's just going to say flat out no. Sure. And I'm, I'm not really interested anyway. Um, and uh, to to their credit, everybody sort of uh, manned up and started figuring out how to make it happen. Uh-huh. Matt called me. Steve called me. Um, and you know, there's a, there was a, a lot of, uh, friendship and water under the bridge and things, particularly between me and, and Hoffy, yeah. uh, Katie from the band. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it just took a while for us. It took about an hour for us back and forth talking to work out that we wanted to talk uh-huh. and that the beautiful thing about it was that Steve was pushing for, a dis- for an answer because they wanted to make the posters and start advertising sure, it. Sure. Um, every single member of the band said, "No, it's 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 a this is a great idea, and maybe we'll do it, but we need to talk first. And if if we can get in a room and talk, sure, then we'll do it. But if not, there's no re- the band was was n- never based on premeditating parts. It was all about the kinetic thing between the four guys. Sure. So it, it was really a band in that sense. Every single one, he, he uh, Steve ended up realizing that Hoffy wasn't getting the group text, so he called him, and Hoffy said yes right away, which surprised me. Uh huh. And I said, "Well, great, you know, I'm 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 interested if we talk." And so Hoffy called me, and we talked. We had talked for about an hour, walking up around Central Park. And, sure. And uh, had a great talk, and decided, well, let's get together for coffee. Got together for coffee, but not before they'd announced the show and it had sold out. <laughs> So I we hadn't had even been tickets. in the same room. Yeah. And and everybody had already bought a ticket, you know. And uh we were we were committed but we still with within the four of us said if this doesn't work and we get it in a room we don't like each other or we or we don't like what we're playing. We didn't even know we were, we could play anymore together. Uh-huh. Um then we're not going to do it. And uh and we did. We ended up getting in a room. We 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 got together. We did what we would usually do before a tour or anything else, is we would go to the rehearsal room. We'd set up, and then we'd leave for coffee, and go hang out for a couple hours, and forget about rehearsing. 
uh-huh. and then come back and, and maybe bash out one or two tunes that aren't even anything we're going to play. And then, um, okay, we're done. Now, that's kind of what we did. <laughs> Decided, okay, we can do the show. We'll meet, we'll meet be- the week before and we'll rehearse. Uh-huh. And, the energy so, was there. And, and it, was, it was amazing. I think it blew us away how many people came from around the country to see mm-hmm. the shows, sure. how quickly they sold out, what it meant to people. Yeah. And then playing uh, one more show, the Belly Up, right, which was just a blast with Steve in a Godzilla costume. We didn't he we didn't tell him about that till just before. <laughs> we played Go-Go by Godzilla by <laughs> Boy Cult and we built a whole set of fake fake buildings with lights inside and and you made the his ear. You made his ear made by letting him, him do that. Made him put it on, yeah. They kicked some girl in the head yeah, while he was crowd that. surfing. Yeah. So was that just kind of it's done, it's nice to have wrapped that um you know, in a nice way, in a positive way, or might the, there be more chapters? I don't know. I think we talked about there being more chapters, but I think really, in the end, we're all so busy, and we sure. try. We have tried a few things this last year, and they just haven't really gelled. They haven't clicked. We've t- we talked about doing a couple things. Mm-hmm. We even talked about doing another record, and we have a we have the beginnings of a record um, that we even talked about releasing a few tracks from. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I don't know. It, it might happen eventually. Um, but at this point, probably not. We're we're really busy doing other things, and and we're all friendly. But uh, I I don't think the impetus is there anymore. Sure. So. Sure. Is was there a difference in your writing style uh, when you were writing for the Truckies or when you were writing for Wire Pony versus this last record? Oh, completely. I mean, the Truckies was fully collaborative, uh-huh. and and there was always a push and pull, which I think is great. It makes you uh, it takes you out of your comfort zone and makes you better at what you do. It can challenge you, mm-hmm. um, but it was it was much it was much more a rock and roll band. It wasn't it wasn't as much about. Uh, I don't know that we we were ever the type of writers that got very straight and uh, uh, intimate with what we were writing about. We were kind of much more either in your face or esoteric or or um playing up in the clouds somewhere um in a good way but mm-hmm. you know or or just cheap trick you know we were <laughs> we weren't really we weren't trying to be um John Lennon uh-huh. you know uh and and it had a, it's it had its own character which is great but but uh yeah there's definitely a difference and very big difference and with the the recording of this record you were you were doing it to eight tracks yeah, eight eight track one inch tape, which is g- ha- <laughs> it's even it's even on the tape machine there at, at playground. It's one half God's God's format, <laughs> and it really is. It's the it's the best, the widest width you can sure. get per track, and it also means that you have to make decisions. You know, you you have to decide whether you're going to put those harmonies on or not, and uh-huh. and uh, you know what you're going to what you're going to put on and what you're going to leave off. And, and you you like the idea of ha- being forced to make those choices as opposed to digital where you can just track I, forever. I love that. I love that idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love stacking harmonies and things all over everything. I wasn't, sure. I wasn't really encouraged to on this record, which was a good thing. And I, I decided that that's we're, we're going to keep it fairly dry. Uh, Cindy's on it. Uh, Justin Collins sings a, a bit with me, especially on Kissing the Beast. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and we kept it pretty pretty much about the song uh, and the vocal and the performance of the band. And uh, I think it worked really well. The next record we're going to cut uh, the beginning of the year, uh-huh. um, we're going to concentrate a little bit more. We're going to throw a bit, of, a bit of that harmony stuff back in there. Yeah, and, all right. And we're going to have some fun. So, But there's a, there are a lot, of, lot of fun little plans for that record. Nice. With with this record, you know your your last couple records have certainly had different release styles. You know the Truckies obviously had their way. Uh, the self to- or right hook of love with Wire Pony was put up on the web, kind of as a pay what you want type deal. Right. And then this is you know a vinyl digital whole deal release with digital. You know this is kind of the first big release you've done since the digital boom. How yeah. how is that impacting you as a musician? I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, obviously this is a completely unknown thing for everybody right now um i think the for me it was really important that it was a physical record Uh especially the way we recorded it uh that it was on vinyl even even a small 
you know, small amount of limited edition of vinyl. Pink vinyl, by the way. It's awesome. And, um, uh, but, but that people can get it any way they want it. I think before we'd been real sort of sticklers about, well, we're only going to do it this way mm -hmm. or we're going to present it that way or we're going to be really under the radar about the formats we use, you know, and maybe maybe we're not really going to encourage the digital or we're not going to encourage the, or we're going to just do digital on this one. And I, it was really important to me that however anybody listens to music, they can get a hold of it. Uh-huh. And, you know, if they... If they I, I'm still on the fence about the whole streaming thing, but, but for right now, I felt where I'm at right now, I'd rather people hear the record. Sure, it, it, absolutely. I, I am really stoked by the record. I sound so Californian as I go. It's okay. It's okay. I, I'm really, uh, there aren't many people up here on the roof, so you right. know, they won't hear I'm you. really Don't stoked, did by the record I made. You so know? rad. And, uh, but, um, but it's, it doesn't, you know, wh however you like to listen to it, I want you to be able to listen to it that way. Uh -huh. So so I think it was just a case of making it available mm -hmm. and letting people decide. Because it really, it's about the songs. It's not about the trickery around the whole thing. Is is Are there particular songs that you love more than others on this record? You know, I have to say, I usually don't like hearing my own records. Sure, sure. And, and every record I've ever made, I could, I could, I'm, I'm, kind of like Noel Gallagher in that I should keep my mouth shut because I could pick him apart uh, and, well, and kind of you ruin your... See, you can see the flaws. You know where yeah, there are little yeah. things in there. And it's not that this record doesn't have flaws. It's sure. got beautiful, like, Dylan-esque flaws. Not that I'm writing as great as Dylan. But in terms of the production, you know, sure, there, sure. there are things where one of us will screw up. I'll hit a wrong chord or or somebody will do something or the flub the lyric or whatever else. But there's a moment there, so we just keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's great, but you know, I could I could ruin your perception of a Trucky record because I could say, well, yeah, that's great, but I could place doubt in your mind by saying, well, yeah, but that song really should never right. been on the record, right? Uh, you know, or that Wire Plenty record, yeah, it was great except for those three but, songs should have been, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but with this one, I I actually en I enjoy. I have to do my homework, you know, building up to the tour in the fall, mm -hmm. and so I've been trying to pick up a few things that I don't remember playing or that somebody else played. Uh -huh. And I actually enjoy listening to it. So I, the record, I f it feels really cohesive mm -hmm. as a record to me, and that I'm really proud of. So you track a lot of this live? Yeah. yeah. yeah most of the record, be particularly because of the nature of the 8-track, the but most of the record was was tracked rhythm sections and a lot of vocals. Uh -huh. And uh, in, in the business, they like they really like you to have instrumentals for television or film mm -hmm. so that they can edit it and it to fit their scene sure and uh, only about half the record we could do that with and even that you have to you have to kind of cover the the vocal that's bleeding in because because uh -huh. i'm in the room singing right next to the drums having fun yeah it, that's all it was was this was this was a blast yeah. to make this record my thanks again to Patrick Dennis for sitting down with me. You can find him on Twitter at at Patrick Dennis AM and go grab the record over at PatrickDennis.com. You will thank me later. So before I wrap things up, it is, of course, time for your weekly Ear Fuel assignment. For those of you new to the podcast, each week I give out a specific album that you should go listen to from beginning to end without any distractions. No cell phones, no nothing. Just sit and enjoy the music because I really believe people have forgotten the idea of listening to music simply for the sake of the music. And this is kind of a return to that idea. So go get this record, turn your phones off, put away your laptops, maybe invite some friends over and just enjoy the record from beginning to end. This week, your assignment is... Fake drum roll... The Flawless Funhouse record by The Stooges. And a lot of you are probably saying, hell yeah, right now. Because if you know this record, that is the instinctive reaction. This is without question one of my top favorite albums of all time. And it happens to be the album that Patrick and I actually bonded over very early on. We both found that we were really, really into The Stooges and specifically this record. Now, it goes without saying that there's nobody in music quite like Iggy Pop. And for me, this is the rock and roll iguana at his very best. There's only one Iggy Pop. He is godly, and you will never find him better than this. The guitar work on Funhouse is face-melting, and it is one of the greatest rhythm sections ever. It's one of those albums that you kind of have to get into. The energy is beyond infectious. Funhouse also proves that saxophones 
work just fine in the punk rock style. And for those of you who think that you know punk rock is only about simple chords and idiocy, you need to understand the beginnings of the sound. And this record is this record is just brilliant. There's no other way to say it. If you somehow don't already worship this record, prepare for your brain to be blown and enjoy 36 minutes of true sonic perfection. So that's what we got for this week. If you want to email me about whatever you're thinking musically, you can get me at getearfuel at gmail.com. You can always get me on Twitter at getearfuel and at the Daily Guru. And hey, uh, make sure you subscribe over on iTunes. That is your weekly ear fuel. Share and enjoy. <laughs>